Tonight we'll be on section 8, and it rhymes this week, God is great. The uh, first place we'll be looking will be the 95th Psalm, Not Psalm 95, verse 3, will be the first verse we'll be looking at. And the whole study is, is focusing on God, and uh, we've started with uh, two great songs that, that led up to this, and had God is so good there, and uh, the whole subject will be about how the greatness of God. Uh, but the introduction to this says, There is only one God, and He alone is great. All other beings and things are totally dependent on His goodness and strength. A comparison should never be made between God and any other creature or thing. As a self-existent creator, He is infinitely above His, uh, or He is in infinitely above His dependence and finite creation. Uh, the mightiest archangel is no closer to being like God than the tiniest microbe. God is incomparable. In the context of the body of believers, this truth is extremely important. There are no great men or women of God in the scriptures or in church history. There are only weak, sinful, and faithless men and women of a great and merciful God. And um, as I read uh, Mr. Washer's introduction there, it kind of reminded me of a, uh, of a song. And uh, the fellow that wrote in that song, he wrote a, uh, the title of it was Indescribable. And he wrote in the first stanza of his song when he was talking about the indescribableness of God, he said, from the heights to the depths of the sea, he said, creation revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature unique in the song that it sings and they all exclaiming indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god all powerful untamable awestruck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing god he goes on to say who has told every lightning bolt where it should go or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow, who imagine the sun and give source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night, said none can fathom. He goes on at the end of that song to say, incomparable, unchangeable. You see the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. And that was a song that a fellow wrote called Indescribable. And he was writing and thinking about this characteristic of God and just the greatness and how it's indescribable. And we'll see that in one of our verses later. But we know that because of Christ, God has that love for those who trust in him. Jeremiah 31.3 tells us it's an eternal love. Romans 5.8 says that we see that love and that Christ died for us while we were still yet sinners. And Ephesians 1 verse 6 tells us that we're accepted in the beloved. We have an amazing God. There's none like unto him. We have a merciful God, and there's no Savior like unto him. And our Lord is great, and there is no king like unto him. So our first point uh, uh, is asking the question, though, how is God described, though, uh, in the following scriptures? Now, we know that God is uh, not comprehensible by our, our finite minds. But we do have some descriptions from the, the, the text of Scripture to tell us what he's like. And our first one in the 95th Psalm, verse 3, said, For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. So to start out with, what we find out here in the text of Scripture, how God is described, he's described as a great God. And I looked up this, this word great that we're studying tonight. God is great. And great means in extent, amount, or intensity, ability, quality, or eminence. In all of those things, extent, amount, intensity, ability, quality, and eminence, to be considerably above normal. That's what great is. And so when God is a great God, he is, as the verse closes with, above all gods for God to be a great king he is above all other kings 
in every extent, amount, intensity, ability, quality, or eminence. He is a great God and a great king above all others. The next place uh, we go to to find a description about God is Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel chapter 9 verse 4, we learn a little bit more about a description of God. In Daniel 9 verse 4, it says, And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and my confession, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. And so in this verse we see another word thrown in there. So we see that he's great in the last one. And here he's great again, but it says great and dreadful. And dreadful here um, has with it the idea of fear. Um, our study tells us that the word dreadful comes from a Hebrew word, yare, which means to fear, revere, or be afraid. So we see that he is great, and his greatness should produce reverence and fear because of his greatness. Um, this word in the uh, Greek translation is thalmatstos, and that word again meaning in the translation remarkable amazing and wonderful and this is just another way of describing God that he's uh, hard to even describe but he's a great God above all others and he is dreadful in the sense that he's amazing and wonderful fearful but it, uh, in the study here Washer even wrote even the smallest revelation of God's greatness and holiness would strike even the most splendid of his creatures with astonishment reverence and even fear God is awesome therefore he is worthy of the greatest reverence and I love this point that he wrote here because um, there's so many so many places in scripture and we could stay here all night and just go example after example after example of this being played out in scripture of what Daniel said here of him being great and dreadful and what Washer said here about how uh, even the smallest revelations of his greatness and holiness would cause even the most splendid of his creatures to be in astonishment and reverence. And I thought about some examples. If, if Bull pulls them, uh, we'll have the verses on the screen here, but we'll have uh, Job 38, 7. And in that verse, you have the angels, the morning stars, saying together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That was talking about how when God was creating and there at the beginning of time as he was uh, talking to Job in that situation and he revealed these things there to Job. But we see how the angels had shouted for joy as God created. As, as some of his splendor and some of his glory and some of his greatness was being seen in the works of his hands, the angels shouted for joy and sung. Luke 15, 7 is another poem that we read. And in Luke 15, 7, we see that heaven rejoices at the work of God. When, when some of God's splendor and glory and greatness is revealed in, in the repentant sinners, heaven rejoices over sinners coming to repentance. We see in Job 40, Job, you know, uh, when he got his uh, audience, he got his chance to speak to God, God answered him back. But this is what Job said. He, put, he said, I lay my hand upon my mouth. When God answered Job, this was the reaction Job had was that he put his hand on his mouth. He said, I'm vile. God, uh, just a little bit of God's greatness was revealed to Job, and it caused that reaction. Exodus 14, 24 through 25, reveals a story about um, where the Egyptians were chasing the Israelites, and it said God looked through the pillar at them. It caused them to fear. It caused them to cry out and, and to, to turn back because God was fighting for them when they saw God looking through the cloud at them. Genesis 28, 16 and 17, Jacob wakes up from a dream that he had about the ladder. And he says, how dreadful is this place? He said, surely the Lord is in this place. That was Jacob's reaction when he realized that he had been dreaming and he had been in the presence of God. Genesis 31, 53, Laban uh, made a compact with, uh, with Isaac and and when uh, Laban decided to lump God in with all the other gods, and he swore by the, the God of uh, Nahor and the God of their father, 
Those weren't the God of Abraham and Isaac. So what did Jacob, what did Isaac do? Isaac didn't swear by those gods. I mean, Jacob, what, Jacob didn't swear by those gods. He swore by the fear of his father Isaac because God was different. And he grew up in a household where God was set apart, where God was seen as fearful and great. And so Jacob didn't lump him in with other gods in that situation. Isaiah 6, 5 Isaiah cries out, Woe is me, I am undone, when he saw the king high and lifted up, sitting on his throne. In Judges 13, 21 through 22, Manoah, Samson's father, declared, We shall surely die because we have seen God. And that was when a situation where the pre incarnate Christ had come to tell them about that they were going to have a son. And they were talking about Samson. But that's what he said when just that little bit, when he realized who he had been talking to, this was the reaction he had. Matthew 17, 5 through 6, Peter, James, and John had fell on their faces and were so afraid at the transfiguration and voice from heaven that they heard up there on the mount with Jesus when his, when his uh, appearance changed and he shined and, he, and he, you know, he, when he was transfigured and then the voice spoke, they were fearful and they fell down. In Luke 5, 8, Peter again, we see him falling on his knees and saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And this was at seeing the Lord's greatness in providing that catch for Peter. Later in Acts in chapter 9, verse 3 through 4, Paul's knocked to the ground and blinded by the light and the vision from heaven. Just that little bit of God's splendor and greatness revealed. And you see the effect it has on his creatures. John 19, 7 through 8, even Pilate was afraid and trembled when the revelation of truth that Jesus was the Son of God was brought about. Just a little bit of God's greatness, just a little bit of his splendor, just a little bit of his glory has an effect on his creatures in many, many, many different verses and, and, and places we could go to and keep pulling this out. But he's awesome. And just a little bit of his greatness revealed and just a little bit of revelation of God's holiness and greatness strikes his creatures with amazement and astonishment. But he is to be reverenced. He is dreadful and he is great. He is our awesome God. To quote another song, a fellow wrote a song, and I love this verse he wrote, and it said, When the sky was darkness in the void of the night, he spoke into that darkness and created the light. Judgment and wrath he poured out on Sodom, but mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. And I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. He still reigns from heaven above with wisdom power and love he's the great king he's the great god he's not like any other and he is dreadful and just even a small amount of his glory and holiness is enough to to put fear and awe and amazement into his creatures so the next verse we'll look at is psalm 104 psalm 104 verse 1 and in psalm 104 verse 1 we see there bless the lord O oh, my soul O oh Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. And then in some of the, the modern English translations, you'll see splendor. It says honor or splendor. The word is rendered in different ways there, but it's uh, communicating the same idea of this, this splendor, this honor, this majesty is, is what's being, the idea is being said here, that he's clothed with that. And our, our study notes said here that God's honor, you know, splendor, and majesty are not some external things that he puts on. They are a part of his very being. Unlike men, God has no need to add something to himself in order to enhance his greatness or his beauty. And what's uh, interesting, I thought about this idea was, since God doesn't need anything to enhance his glory or his beauty or his splendor or his beauty... He doesn't need anything to make himself majestic. He just is. He is already in and of himself honorable. And he's, mag he's majestic. In Ex I went back and searched this out. And in Exodus 28, uh, verse 40, um, it said, uh, And Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles and bonnets shalt thou make for them. And here's why. For glory and for beauty. In the priest, uh, uh, see, in the old time priest, they made these garments that they had to wear. And the garments that the priest would wear when he served 
was for the purpose of glory and beauty. Why? Because man wasn't glorious nor beautiful anymore. Man didn't have it, uh, any majesty about him anymore. You know, we've talked about this a lot in the last two lessons, but the fall of man really ruined man. It left a whole lot of uh, marred uh, uh, characteristics and, and, and left some, uh, uh, some scars there and, and some, some twistedness. And one thing it did was it made man's nakedness a shameful thing. So Aaron and the priesthood, they had to wear garments to make themselves majestic and beautiful. But God doesn't. God in and of himself is clothed with majesty. He is uh, the very standard by which we would say something would be majestic. It, it would have to be, it's always going to be less than him, but, but he is the very standard of majesty and splendor. It doesn't get any higher than him, for it's in his very being that he is, he is majestic in his nature. The next verse in, in Psalm 104 there, I, I want to add it in too because it's just so awesome. It says, Who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. I mean, that, there's, there's another description of God, that he, that he wears light like a garment. That's how majestic God is. And I love this because as we just talked about with Peter, James, and John, they fell on their face at the transfiguration. There we have another uh, instance where Jesus was proving himself God. Who clothes himself in light? They couldn't even look at him when he started to shine and, and he was transfigured there. He's God. And that's how God exists. God clothes himself with light as with a garment. Majesty and splendor is our God. He's very great, the scripture says. And as this psalm right here started out, it said, O oh Lord my God, Thou art very great. And I couldn't help but think about the wonderful hymn that's been left to us. And we, we sing it quite often. And it's still awesome for me just to think about the lyrics of it. He said, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. And so as we go to our next point, which is in Psalm 145, 145 verse 3. And in 145 verse 3, the Bible says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. And so the key there is the unsearchableness. As we talked about, as you come all the way up to this, you know, God is above all gods. There's none more maj majestic than he is. There's none higher than he is. He is the most high. His greatness is unsearchable. That's the reason why we could go verse after verse, chapter after chapter, and, and even all the things we could see and absorb and, and try to, to take in, we could never search out and come to the end of God's greatness. There's always more. There's always something else to be taken in. We can't comprehend fully his greatness. And the scripture even declares to us that his full greatness, his greatness is unsearchable. But it says here, the Lord is greatly to be praised. Greatly to be praised. And as we've looked at three of them already, uh, there's just, uh, uh, um, as we've seen in humans over the years, as, as the church has, has developed and, and continued and grown and We've just had hymns and hymns and hymns and songs and songs and songs have been written about the greatness of God, about the greatness of his works, about the great things that he has done. He's unsearchable. His, I mean, his greatness is unsearchable. And so he is greatly to be praised for how great he is. Our study note says that God's greatness is beyond investigation or inquiry. It cannot be searched out or measured. It would be far easier to count the sand in all the oceans and deserts of the world, or to number all the stars in the heavens than to measure the greatness of God. And I thought about what he wrote here and what we've uh, seen in some of these other songs and the focus being on, on God's awesome power in creation and what some of these psalms have talked about and how he stretches out the heavens. Even if we could do this, even if all of us were to got together and we somehow counted up all the grains of the sand we somehow counted all of it and got a number. Somehow we counted all the stars and got a number. 
God would still be greater than, than all that we've amassed because he made it all. And he upholds it all the time. He holds it all together. He's greater than his whole, congr whole uh, creation put together. He's greater. So then our third point goes into it. says, what do the following scriptures affirm about the greatness of God? How is the one true God contrasted with all other so-called gods? And in this one, it'll be uh, starting in Psalm 77, and, and the way the, the verses are, it'll just be moving up a chapter or two at a time. Um, but it starts in Psalm 77, verse 13. And in that verse, as we start out this chain here, it says, um, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? And so the two questions we were asked to answer was, what do the scriptures affirm about the greatness of God? And so to answer that question is it affirms that our God is a great God. The second thing we're asked to, to answer is how is the one true God contrasted with all other so-called gods? Well, in this verse, we see that we, a question form is put, but it's rhetorical. There's, there's, there's no answer. It says, who is so great a God as our God? And, of course, the answer to that is that there's none. There's, there's no God that can be compared to our God. There's nothing in all of creation that can, can be compared to God because he's greater than even all of his creation. So the next uh, one is in 86, Psalm 86, verse 10. And in that verse it says, For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. And so to answer our two questions, the first question is, the truth asserted is that God is great and does wondrous things. He is God alone. And how does he compare to the other so-called gods? There is no other great God who does wondrous things. He alone is God, and he alone does the wondrous works of God. So then we go over to 95, Psalm 95, verse 3. We've already read it one time, but it's worth reading again. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. So the truth asserted here is that God is a great God and that God is a great king. And then as the, to answer the second one, how does he compare then to all other so-called gods? He's greater. He's above all. He's above all powers and authorities. He's above all kings. He is above all, greater than all kings and greater than all other so-called gods. And the next one, 135, 135 verse 5 said, For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. There David asserts or in, in this psalm here, For I know. It, I, I love the I know here because it's now we've got to a personal place. This is where it really matters. This is where it gets, comes down with rubber meets the road for each one of us. Can we say that? I know. I know that my God is great. I know that the Lord is is great. And then there again, it's personal again, and that our God, that, I mean, that our Lord is above all gods. Ours. I know it. I know he's greater. And he's our Lord. But the truth, that's the truth asserted here, is that our God is the Lord, and he is greater than all gods. He is above all other gods. We must know that. We must believe that. We must have that personally established within our hearts that he is God and that he is greater than any other any other power, any other authority that could come against him but God is great, God is the Lord, God is the king God does wondrous things God is God, is God alone and the Lord God is above all other so called gods who is so great as our God the answer is none and so our Fourth point uh, does something kind of similar, but it's all the way back at Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 32. And in Deuteronomy 32, we go to verse number 3, 
And in Deuteronomy, we've got a different set of questions here. This is more of an application. But it says, according to the following scriptures, what should be our attitude and our response to the greatness of God? How shall we live in light of his unsearchable greatness? And in Deuteronomy 32.3, we're told, um, yeah, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. And so to answer our two questions, what should be our attitude? Our attitude should be one of, 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 of acknowledgement. We should be ascribing greatness to our God. We should publish and make public, uh, you know, make known his great name and his great deeds. And how should we live? We should live in a way that our lives should show the greatness of God by publishing his great works done in his great name. And I saw something this week, um, just to, to, to add to this right here a little bit. This, this truly is one of the, the greatest things in all of creation that gives God glory. It's when our lives are different. When, when, when we live out a, a witness where people see the work of God in our lives. I saw a little video somebody put together, and the key word in it was former. They, they had a bunch of pictures of different people as they come across here, and it was former, former, former. And that's what it kept saying was former, and it had a, a, a particular sinful title attached to it, former. And that was the whole thing was that video was bringing glory to God in the fact that those people in that video were now known as Christians, but they were something else. They were something else, but now they were different. Their lives were showing forth the great works of God in their lives. And God was being glorified in that video as one after another, picture after picture, former, 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 as they seen the work of God in bringing them to repentance and, and changing their lives. And that's how we each should live in, in a way that we would publish uh, the, the great works of God and that we would, uh, to, to, to dovetail on to last week, that we wouldn't live in a way to where our lives would be full of hypocrisy, but that our lives would be one of ascribing greatness to our God and in, in publishing his great works. So next place will be First uh, Chronicles 16.25 with these two questions in mind. 16... First Chronicles 16 and 25. It said, For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. So to answer our first question, what should our attitude be? It should be one of great praise and of reverential fear towards our living God. And then how should we uh, live our lives in, in uh, light of his unsearchable greatness. We should live a life of great praise to the Lord and a life of reverential fear towards the only true and living God who is great. Uh, you see, basically our, our whole life should be kind of like um, I, I draw inspiration from what Isaac did, I mean what, what Jacob did. When, when the culture and, and, and when people try to, to, to bring God down, when they try to make him something that he's not, when they try to take away his greatness, when they try to, to, to smear his name, when they, when they, when they uh, uh, attack his greatness, we should live a life that would show that we believe in him in such a way that we're fearful of him. Because that's the truth of the matter is that God is a fearful God. We've gone over that and seen that, how the, the true reality is if, if just a, a small amount of his holiness and greatness was shown, uh, I mean, nobody can stand before it. Even men that we would think of as great men like Job and, and Isaiah when faced with just a little bit of God's holiness and greatness, put their hand over their mouth and they fell down and cried out, I'm undone. So we should, we should live that way in our lives that we really believe that. We walk like, like Jacob said, that he swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Jacob knew one thing growing up as a boy is that Isaac feared his God and he was worthy of it. His God is worthy I mean, uh, Isaac's God was worthy, and he's our God too. He's worthy of a reverential fear. To, to give a little example of uh, a, a fellow I heard, he was a former Christian, that's what he claimed to be, but he was now a, a Muslim. And this, was, this broke my heart because the reason he said he converted to Islam was because he said in the Christianity that he was in, nobody feared God. 
He said people claimed to believe in God. They claimed to believe in the God of the Scripture. He said, but their lives were filled with such hypocrisy, the people he saw around him, that they lived as if they, that he didn't even exist. They lived as if there was no accountability. They, they, by their lives, they, they showed this man that there was no fear in his eyes before the living God. But he claims when he went to Islam that he saw that. He saw a fearful God. That's what he claimed he found. But see, I just, it hit my heart because I thought that's such a sad testimony because our Bible, our scripture tells us, the Hebrew says that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And he's the living God. And that ought to be a reality in our life that, that ought to mark us as Christians is that we have a God who is worthy to be feared because he is fearful, he's dreadful, and he's great. But that should be a mark in our lives that we live in to where somebody might say the same of us, you know, that we walk before the, the fear of our lives which should be our God. And then Psalm 104.1. 1041. Uh, and we've already read it one time before too. But um, I like this one. I like this one a lot. This, this one's a good one um, to, for, for the practicality part. And we practice it here at Bethany a lot. And, and Sunday, Robbie Stone got a blessing out of this application. But it said, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. And I'm sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. I thought this was the one about singing. Uh, but anyway, to, to answer our two questions on this one is, it's, it's the heartfelt. You know, well, it's, we're leading up to it, though. But when we've, when we've got our lives ordered rightly, I mean, you know, I mean, we're not perfect, but when we've got our, our lives ordered in a way that we're publishing God's name, we're showing forth his works, we're, we're, we're ascribing greatness to him, when we're fearful of him and living in reverential fear before him, we should do it all. It should all be from the heart. Like we talked about that personal verse in, in Psalm 135, it should be a heartfelt. He says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. A heartfelt attitude of, of blessing or affectionate praise should be rendered from us towards our God, who is very great and clothed with honor and majesty. We should have a, a live a lifestyle of affectionate praise, motivated and stirred up by the contemplation of his greatness and his majesty. And you know, like we sung the song earlier, Jesus Loves Me. And, and as, you, as we sing that song, it, it honestly should, should stir up affections in our heart towards him to think that he would love us. You know, we've, we've talked about it already in, in previous lessons, how uh, you know, wicked we are and, and, and how uh, without him, how wicked we would be. And, and, but God, it tells us Romans 5, 8, like we started out with at the beginning, that he loved us and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And, and it, we should have some affection and some heartfelt uh, uh, praise for him when we think about the, the greatness of his mercy and, and the greatness of his love and the greatness of his patience and the greatness of his grace. It, it should stir some affections in the heart. He's, uh, our study note says here that the word blessed comes from the Hebrew word barak, which uh, when, when it directed and indicated here, directed towards God, it denotes a joyful exclamation of admiration, thanksgiving, and praise. So we should, have a, we should live a lifestyle of, of blessing, of affectionate praise towards our God. And so if we go over to Psalm 111, we'll keep building on this. Psalm 111, verse 2. It says there, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. And see, this one here is another one. It builds on that idea of the heartfeltness. You know, the works of the Lord are great. They are great. Objectively, it's just true. The works of his hands are great. The creation, redemption. I mean, all the things we could, we could go over, you know, those are the two main ones we think of. But all the works of the Lord are great. And they're sought out of them that take pleasure in them. So we should have here to answer our two questions an attitude of gratefulness, of satisfaction and pleasure in the works of God. And number two... How we should be thankful and satisfied to live our lives searching out those great works of God. For we need to know them in order to ascribe glory to him. We need to know them in order to publish them and make them known. So we ought to be satisfied in that to, to search out and, to, and to, uh, to learn of his great works. And to live a life of heartfelt thankfulness for those great works. And to go on to our last verse, Psalm 138 verse 5. 
And this is the one I was thinking I was at earlier, but I jumped ahead. But Psalm 138, verse 5, to finish up here. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. And I like this one here, too. He said an attitude. An attitude. To answer our question, we should have an attitude of joyful singing. I like how Paul put it in Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. He said, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And here is a description of what that is. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one another in the fear of God. That's the way a Christian's life ought to look. That's what we ought to aspire to. That's what we ought to uh, strive for is to live this life, this spirit-filled life of singing joyful songs, of singing thankful songs, of, of singing affectionate uh, uh, praises to our God and submitting ourselves to the service of one another in the fear of God. But we ought to be reverential, thankful, happy, joyful, ascribing to the Lord greatness. We ought to make known his great name and his great works. Praise him affectionately from the heart, be motivated by who God is and what God has done. In this way, be filled with the Spirit, singing with the understanding, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs of praise unto our great God. This should be our daily attitude and lifestyle before God, a lifestyle of continual prayer to God, of praise and thanksgiving for all of his greatness. And um, to, to, to end right here, I just wanted to read this, what the Apostle Paul said about it. And he captured it so much better than I could. But he said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 24, he said, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it.